If you haven't started it yet, now is a very good time. Um, both individual and group are due tonight as well. Don't forget there are two separate assignments that are due. So you got one and two. They're separated out nicely for ease of use for you all, I would hope. Um, for this one, I need the web report. For this one, I just need the link to your repository. But make sure that you get that in. Oh, other thing, before we move on, we have a midterm coming up. So if you zoom out, I guess, so you can see everything. Today's the 19th. The third, we have a midterm. I am just about ready with the study guide for you. I would expect to see that pretty soon. But basically, it's going to be a list of questions for you all to mull over and peruse and get a feel for what kinds of questions we will be having. Um, they'll all pretty much more or less be short answer types of questions. So I wouldn't freak out too much. It should be basically just distilling everything that you have learned so far in class. It's the third, yes. I think it's that first Wednesday in March. That's in the calendar, it's in the syllabus, yeah. So since we haven't really talked about it yet, um, let me just give you a two second overview. Nice in the beginning of class, that way you can catch it if you uh, watch this back later. Um, I will open it up for 24 hours. So basically on midnight, absolutely. I I did that even when we weren't in uh, an online modality, I felt it was you know, kind of helpful for people to remember what the important beats were. But the way it's going to work is since it's online, I will open up the exam in Blackboard at midnight. I will close it at the following midnight. You can have it open for as long as you want during that 24 hour period, but you have to have it submitted within that day, basically. It will take about the length of time a normal exam would take. I'm not making it longer or tricky or anything like that. It'll be a straightforward exam, honestly. So don't, yeah, I'm not going to tr try to trick you all or anything like that. I think that's beneath you. But only real thing to mention, and I'm going to have a big old blurb in the study guide. Don't copy and paste from the slides. Don't plagiarize from the internet. Um, basically, don't cheat. Don't copy and paste. Don't go down that path that's going to make yours and my life a living hell if we get into that space. So just answer to the best of your ability, and we'll all be, be happy. Um, and if you have any questions on what plagiarism is, you can always feel free to bring it up. But kind of the, say I've got a two paragraphs so far um, on that. But rewrite things in your own words. Don't just copy and paste stuff from the internet. That's not helpful for you for remembering things or for me for having to figure that out. Um, where is I going with this? Thought I had an angry old man point, but I don't remember what it was now. Anyway, don't cheat. That's just kind of the takeaway for that. Oh, yeah, that was what it was going to be. I know that since you are online, I am not going to have you do the lockdown browser. It will be written response, so it'll be short answers. But no lockdown browser, nothing like that. I'm going to anticipate that you're all going to have the material in front of you. Um, and I'm not going to do that horrible invasion of privacy that that browser seems to do. Or that, uh, is it an extension or a browser? But I am not a fan of that. But yeah, I, I guess to your question, I may have some multiple choice. It just kind of depends. The exams that I make that are, I, I tend to do this every semester. I make my exams like written written responses, short answers, and they're a pain in the ass to grade. <laughs> Not that you care, because it takes like twice as long as it would be to just to blast through multiple choice, but um, I feel like with short answers, I can at least understand where you're coming from, I, I suppose. You know, it's, yeah, 
it'll be mainly written response. All right. Yes, I I don't like. I'm I'm a big advocate of user privacy, and that uh, uh, that makes me feel gross inside just reading about it. So I feel bad for all of you that have to go through it, but I also understand professors want to uh, ensure a non-cheating environment too, right? And it's it sucks from both ends. Don't uh, you know? You you all hate it. The professors all hate it too. But there's nothing better, unfortunately, for some. Anyway. We'll just build that into the exam, and again, don't freak out. It shouldn't be that bad. If you've been keeping up with the lectures and the homework and the content, you will be fine, honestly. And you'll have a full 24 hours to do it, too. So it's not like you have one hour and you have to stress out that, oh, crap, the internet went down or something like that. And I will do my best to be available pretty much all day as well if you run into technical issues. Should be all right. I haven't decided if it's going to be Blackboard questions or like a Word document that you pull down and fill out yet. It's still leery of Blackboard, <laughs> even though I've been using it for a year now. Um, I came from a Moodle environment, which is also not that great. But um, Blackboard's been doing some weird things to me this semester. Anyway, we should get through some more stuff so that we can have this on the exam as well. So that way you don't have to worry about it for the final. Um, what we're going to be going over now is requirements engineering. So we have talked about configuration management. We've talked about the processes. Now we're going to start actually getting into the artifacts that make up our software projects. And one of the core artifacts that are out there are requirements. Now, these things are going to, I have to caveat this for every single lecture, right? It's going to be not exciting, but Requirements are probably one of the most important things that we do as software engineers. And depending on your process, you will put them in different places, right? With Waterfall, this is one of the first things you do. With Agile, it might be one of the last things that you do, but they will be there in some, some form. And what these are basically going to be are written out prose in English or whatever your company's first languages, they're going to be very specific sentences that say exactly what some feature does. Okay, It's going to give you, the developer, without any shadow of a doubt, exactly what you have to be implementing. <clears throat> and we have a whole bunch of different things to go over. So why do we have them? What are they? The different types of requirements, different categories, what are the processes for requirements engineering. So we'll be getting into all of this. But I'm going to let you read this quote here. And I'm just going to kind of talk over it a little bit. And this is where I've, I've said this multiple times. The programming is the easy part. Okay. The requirements engineering is the hard part. And the reason why is you are specifying exactly what you are building. Okay, so you actually have to do the mental work of envisioning what the software will be doing, how exactly it will be doing it at every step of the way without ever having possibly built it. You all have had discussions, right? You will have talked about features you'd like. Maybe if you're agile, you're doing user stories, which we'll get to a little bit later, but little cards with the GUI should be responsive, or we should talk to a RESTful API, you know, high-level stuff. We also call them goals in other languages or other processes. But if you screw up requirements, um, you've basically killed the project before it even got off the ground. And you will get experience writing requirements very soon, so your proposal is your current assignment. Your next one will be working on requirements, basically, for your projects. Um, and you're going to be doing that hand-in-hand hand with a little bit of development. But this quote, it's actually pretty good. And this is how I, I and a lot of software engineers tend to feel about requirements. They are um, difficult to get off the ground, but once you have them, you basically know exactly what you have to do, right? If you are building a, you know, a mobile application, and it's going to talk to my headset, which is doing weird doubling things in my ears again, because Sennheiser, apparently. Um, 
but I need a requirement to specify the packets, you know, if I'm sending it via Bluetooth or via a wire or something like that. How is the data being streamed to my headset? Or how is my phone controlling my Twitch stream? Exactly what is the layout of my GUI going to be? What are the buttons that I have? What are the exact functionalities of each and every one of these things that I would be doing? Right, so when we get to requirements, and you're going to get some examples here pretty soon of what they are, since I, I keep talking about them, we haven't really looked at any. This is going to be the heavy lifting, right? The mental work is the hard stuff. Once you get into programming, again, whether you're a good programmer yet or not, it, it's a mechanical process. You can figure out how to do something. The tricky parts of programming are when you're in a, uh, a new space, when you don't understand how to do something. Like maybe you don't understand function pointers. Maybe you don't understand queues or lists or trees. Learning how to do that is the hard part, but once you figure it out, it's just, okay, I've got that um, muscle memory for writing code. Anyway, what are requirements? We have some definitions here for you. It is a capability or a condition to which a system must conform. So capability is basically just some function that you're performing, right? What is this requirement telling your system to do? Or it's a constraint, meaning that the system can never do this thing, or this function can never exceed these bounds, or you must be within this particular range, right? If I have a, you know, let's say it's a network-based application, I must have a constant latency of, you know, 60 or something like that, or 30, or my input voltage range is 3.3 volts because I'm dealing with an embedded system. Basically, we're being very, very precise with what we're telling our developers to do. Effectively, the nice thing about requirements is that you don't really care who's programming it. Right. I could, we could come up with a requirement specification. Let's say instead of doing a bunch of individual projects, we're doing one big class project, right? And I'm the project manager, <clears throat> or maybe I'm the customer, I guess, and we have a list of requirements we've agreed on. I could give each and every team that list of requirements. You would all probably implement it slightly differently, but you would end up with the same product at the end. Ideally, I mean, there might be minute differences with um, if there's any flexibility for creativity or anything like that, but you would all still deliver pretty much the same product and it would probably meet all those requirements, right? So the, the kind of nice thing about this is that you can really, you know, split up your teams, maybe bring in contractors if you need to, though that's not always the best idea. But you're basically outlining exactly what has to be done. And requirements are a very, very important aspect of the process here. All right, mouse go off screen. Does that make sense so far, though? And we're going to consider requirements as a software artifact. And I keep using this word artifact, meaning it is something that we would put under configuration management, right? Something we could put under revision control if it's, say, a Word document or if it's going into a big requirements system where every requirement is an object in this thing and we can link to them and you know, link a requirement to a line of code, to a test case, to a design decision, to a maintenance activity. We'll get to traceability a little bit later here in the slide too. But these are, are basically very, very important things and this is where you can really lever leverage your technical writing skills too. All right, good so far? Recaffeinate. So we have different levels of requirements. I've been kind of talking about them in terms of technical prowess, right? In terms of they're specifying the system should do this, it should do that, it should be in this range, it should never violate this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's a very implementation slash technical level we are specifying the product. We have other requirements too. We could have business level requirements or very, very high level requirements where this instead of like a technical goal, it's going to be how, how does this help our business needs? 
right? So we're bubbling up in the chain of command, I suppose, at a company. Is the customer going to be satisfied with this product if we do this, this, and this? Um, you know, we are going to use this product to get into a particular market by doing X, Y, and Z. You know, we're going to be making a mobile application that is leverages like a Firebase or a cloud service or, or something of that nature. Basically, it's a very broad idea and it's intended to focus on business concerns or maybe marketing concerns or something like that. Could be as simple as the customer gets information from an API. Now, this would be in a high level document. Maybe it's in a vision document where it's, again, kind of a, a marketing or a business case for why we need this product. Here are all the things that it will do to satisfy our, our market goals. Might be in a scope document where we're trying to really kind of put a boundary around this, this project that we're working on. You know, maybe it's a massively multiplayer online game because we are an indie startup. Here are the boundaries of this system, right? It is going to be scoped to be a browser game instead of a Android game. It is going to be scoped to support 30 players per instance or something of that nature, right? So could be high level, could be business focused. These are helpful to kind of set goals for your teams. Are they always technical in nature? No, but they can really help to structure the rest of your projects, right? when we talk to our customers, when we talk to our clients, talk to our business managers, things of that nature. We also have user requirements. So these are going to be what the user should be concerned with, right? How will you be using the system as a person or as a client? Basically, how are you going to be interacting with this thing? Maybe what data can you expect to receive or transmit to the system? Could be, say, use cases where user X enters the application and the example we had a few slides or a few uh, modules back was the um, monthly check system right user interacts with the system enters their time gets a paycheck at the end of the week that would be like a use case type of scenario we'll talk about use cases pretty soon effectively a user requirement is going to involve the user in some way <clears throat> could be quality related so how fast does this thing perform Maybe what are the aesthetics of it? Is it a responsive web app? Is it something that can be resized if you flip your phone around? Um, user centric is, is kind of the takeaway there. And then implementation level, and this is kind of what I was talking about before. These are gonna be very technical details. So these are the things that you would go ahead and implement. We're going to call them functional and non-functional requirements. Remember those two keywords because they're very important. He said, thinking of exams in the near future. These are basically going to specify different kind of levels of technical implementation for your systems. And these, so these are FRs and NFRs, functional requirement, non-functional requirement. These are gonna go into something called a software requirement specification or an SRS get excited and hyped about that term because that's basically your final term project delivery document is an SRS. Um, you can include other things in an SRS too. We can include user requirements. We can even include business requirements if it makes sense. Um, but basically it is your big word document of everything this project is doing. Think of it like a term project report in a way with very specific line entries that we need. So we have all of these different levels of requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we have a little bit more detail on what these are. Since I already talked through them, I'm just going to skip through this slide. But again, business high level, user, user level, functional. I, I suppose functional and non-functional we didn't talk about. Functional requirements are... Uh-oh, lost our volume here. Okay, so functional requirements are going to be very, very specific requirements. They're going to be very quantifiable requirements. 
And what I mean by this, let me uh, leave my little pointer here. These things are requirements that you can give to a programmer and they can very, very easily implement them. So functionals are basically those requirements that tell you exactly what to implement, right? You can quantify them. You can say, yes, this requirement has been implemented correctly just by analyzing it. If you have a requirement that says a unit conversion function takes in Fahrenheit values from a range of 0 to 100 and converts them to Celsius values within whatever that conversion range is, you can very easily test that, yes, that's happening, right? You're never passing in a negative number. You're never passing in a number greater than 100. It's very easy to measure that this requirement is correct. It's quantifiable, if that makes sense. So with these functional requirements, we can also call them behavioral requirements, though functional tends to be a, a better term. Um, effectively, they're very, very specific. Um, and again, requirements are basically going to be like a sentence, maybe two, but effectively you don't want to get too wordy with them. Otherwise, it leads to ambiguities and you don't like ambiguity in requirements. You want them to be very, very clear. But an example here would be, um, let's say that the system shall perform X activity. Um, and I'm using that word shall very specifically because it is a way to write requirements. Um, the system shall never exceed a response time of five milliseconds. So it has to respond within five. And very, very quantifiable. <clears throat> Now, this could be something that is hardware-based. It could be software-based. It doesn't really matter. It's going to be directly related to your system. Functional makes sense before I move on to non-functionals. Basically, this is your recipe for how to write a program or how to develop a project. Uh, let's take another example. Last semester, I had a project team do a magic mirror. If you're not familiar with what that is, it is basically a you get like a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or something like that, and you get a display. You put two-way reflective glass over the front of it, and then it looks like a mirror, but you can see the display coming from behind it. So you have like a calendar or something like that. Um, you know, let me pull up an example so that we can kind of talk through this since I think it's kind of cool. Uh, be prepared. The default software for Magic Mirror, I think Hey Sexy is one of the... Uh, um, make you feel good about yourself in the morning type of quotes that are on there. Magic mirror. So, get uh, stuff kind of like this. Oh, good. For once, um, Google hasn't, <laughs> hasn't failed me here. All right. So, lots of these pictures of people taking pictures of themselves in their mirrors, but Basically, there's a display behind the scenes here. Um, you're pulling information from the internet, and it's kind of ghostly appearing on this mirror. It's magic, right? So what would some requirements be for this thing? <clears throat> well, if we're looking at software, I have movable widgets on screen that can pull from various sources, from various RESTful APIs. Um, region on top of screen pulls news from New York Times every hour. Middle left widget displays current date. Middle left widget displays current time. Middle right widget displays weather every five minutes. Okay, so very, very particular things. We can also have hardware requirements here too. If this thing is running a Raspberry Pi, device must draw or must plug into common, you know, wall outlets. Device must supply power for display behind Magic Mirror. So again, very, very, very specific. And if you do have a spare Raspberry Pi laying around, these things are super cool. Actually, I made a little one myself using a e-ink display that I had purchased, thinking it'd be fun to play with. And uh, I have a little Magic Mirror that consumes absolutely zero power when it's on, except for the device itself, or the, uh, the Pi itself. 
Which, the last time I checked, I think the Pi consumes like 5 watts of power per year. So it's nothing. <laughs> anyway, functional is very, very specific. I'm spending a lot of time on this because you will be writing requirements very soon. The non-functionals then, this is the flip side, so we're going to also call these NFRs. These are quality driven. Okay, so what that means is that sometimes it is actually hard to measure them. System is very performant. System responds very quickly. Um, yeah, effectively, you're describing what the, maybe like what the user is feeling when they're using it. Like sometimes non-functionals are called the illities. So usability, um, performability, <laughs> performance, but basically it's kind of the fluffy types of things that make separate a standard application from something that is very good effectively. Maybe it responds very quickly, maybe it's highly secure. Basically these things, they can be measured, but it's very, very difficult to do that. And what I mean by that is that let's say that you are going for a usability type of quality attribute. So a non-functional requirement system must be very highly usable by as many people as possible. It doesn't make, you know, it, it sounds good on paper, but how do you measure that? Well, if I get, let's say I have a phone application, I want it to be usable. That means that people enjoy using it, right? It means that it's responsive. It means that, you know, the display isn't laggy, that people have a good time trying out my application here. But how do I measure that? Well, the only way I can really think of is user studies, right? Let's bring in 500 people, give them the application and record the responses, then measure what they think about it. It's not, I can just go in and check a test case. It is a, it, like a detailed study where we have to bring people in or something like that. So effectively, you're just describing the qualities of the system with these things. And interestingly, these can be very highly critical. So how secure is your system, right? You're writing a banking application and one of your non-functional requirements is system must be highly resilient to cyber attack. Okay, so that means we're not leaking data. How do you test that? It's very, very difficult. You know, you can do pen testing and things of that nature, but if your system doesn't meet that highly secure requirement that you have, you've basically leaked user data to the internet and your system has failed. So it can be very, very important, but difficult to measure. Um, and a lot of times these non-functionals tend to have kind of a more like a global impact to your system. Whereas a, a functional requirement might be a very specific instance of like one little subcomponent, right? It's very, very specific. Non-functionals can impact the system as a whole. They can be specific too. I'm just kind of saying they have a tendency to be a lot broader in nature. Um, okay, didn't want Google's thing to pop up there. Things that we consider here, so again, qualities are basically what I'm talking about. We can also look at constraints, so things that the system should and should not do. Again, kind of at a more broad, quality-driven level. We might consider error conditions or interfaces to our systems to be non-functionals. But uh, effectively, functional is going to say what the system does. Non-functionals are going to be the criteria for that system. So what is it actually, sh you know, what should this thing be doing? Specific, fluffy, I guess, is how I like to think about these things. So on the next slide, I've got a slide for you all to interact with. Um, so start thinking of some examples here. Oh, I don't have it. Okay, never mind. I take that back. I thought I had it there. The slide who comes later. Anybody think of an example of a functional requirement? Let me pop this in the chat. Okay, so multiplayer in a game. 
And that would be, let's see, authentication. So these are um, bases for requirements. So you're getting there. They should be exceedingly specific. Yeah, so multiplayer, honestly, I would bring up to a user or a cust like a business level. So that's a very broad idea, right? So a, a functional requirement example for multiplayer would be server instances can support a maximum of 64 players at a single time. Very specific. Hit reg. <laughs> You can define your yeah your hitbox hit hitboxes I assume you're talking about. Um, you can define very specific boundaries, sure. So Jacqueline's point is authentication. So authentication would again be a little bit broader. Password, yeah, password requirements. That's a very yes, absolutely. So very specific. So system must perform authentication would be a kind of a broad. It would almost be a non-functional almost. Because it's very broad, it describes that we are performing some kind of a security-based activity. The functional, yeah, system must support a specific set of password requirements where these requirements are X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a, a better a better look at that. <clears throat> um, being able to respond to user input. Yeah, so that would probably be a good, that'd be a very good high level requirement, I would say. Um, what does it mean to respond to user input, though? I mean, so this is kind of where we're getting into the mental picture of things. So let's go with the, uh, the multiplayer game example, because that's kind of a nice construct. So this is, again, this would be a high level business case or business requirement or user requirement. We have a multiplayer game. Perfect. Functional requirements would be describing the hitboxes of the characters. So I assume we have some kind of a, you know, maybe a fighting game, a first person shooter, something like that, right? So defining the very specific hitboxes of our character models, authenticating with the system to make sure that you are who you say you are, as Jacqueline said, you know, our login screen is going to have password requirements, our user inputs, Okay, so change display, change menu, display information. Yeah, okay, so yes. Basically, we have to think of specifics. E exactly. Non-functional, no lag. Yep, there you go. System is not laggy. System is very performance, right? So if we're doing a no lag environment, that means that we have to be very good with our... Um, yeah, it's been a while since I've done this, but it's your like your path prediction, try to minimize rubber banding, right? Where you're having the server do all the calculations and transmit it back. Yeah, so these are things that we can try to do. Absolutely. Definitely good examples. But I guess you kind of see where how we constructed this though, right? One of you had the initial idea of a multiplayer game. So this is a High level idea. Then we start drilling down into the specifics. So Jacqueline's talking about authentication. So we're going to need an authentication system, right? So we'll probably have a use case. We'll talk about use cases soon. Here is our user login system. Here's how the user would log in. Okay, let's derive some requirements specific to each and every one of these activities we have to do. Maybe we're going to constrain the username so that it is only non profane names. So we will basically check against a list of blacklisted words or something like that. Let's verify the password. Let's have a lag minimization scheme where we're going to be doing a lot of advanced algorithms for, you know, transmitting data to and from the server, maybe doing some local predictions, having the server verify them, avoid your character doing that horrible, let's keep moving and then zip back type of thing. Yep, definitely, definitely getting down the correct path. So that's good. Basically, the takeaway for this is going to be when I ask you to do your requirements for your projects, ask your, your team. So you're going to do this as a team-based activity pretty soon. 
um, when you're writing them down and you're trying to figure out if it's a good requirement or not, if I'll be happy with them or not, pretend that I am glaring at you asking for more detail about every single thing that you're writing down, and then you probably have your answer if it's precise enough or not. So definitely good examples here. Um, other things, system must operate between 3.3 and 5 volts. If you have an embedded system, you have to support multiple screen modes. So you have to support portrait, landscape, mobile phone, desktop, etc., etc. right? So definitely uh, some good stuff here. OK. So moving on, <clears throat> I talked about the SRS document. All right, so I've got a couple examples here that I pulled off the internet. Um, depending on your environment, depending on your company, your SRS may be structured differently. We will have a very specific format for your term project final deliverables. So basically, I'll give you what has to be filled in for this. Um, and I guess the other thing I should mention, too, since we haven't really talked about the term project all that much other than you have to start working on it, um, everything that you are doing this semester group-wise for homework assignments, this will be a part of your final deliverable. <clears throat> so it's not going to be like a massive push at the end of the semester. Oh, crap, we have these 30 things we have to do. No, you're going to basically just, okay, here's all of our use cases. They are in the correct place. Here are the requirements we developed. They go in this part of the document. It's going to be basically a long process. It's not going to be, okay, we have to do documentation now kind of thing. We're going to be doing it all semester. So don't get too freaked out when you see this kind of stuff. But what do we have? We have an introduction. So get uh, excited about writing technical introductions. There is a specific format for these. Uh, we have a description of features of our system, maybe any assumptions that we're making. So assumptions and dependencies, quite important. What do you assume the system will be experiencing? What do you make? What assumptions do you make about its environment that it lives in? Are we depending on any packages? Maybe if you're writing a Node.js application, what dependencies are we using? What are the versions of those dependencies? Um, any constraints? What types of users are we expecting to apply the system to? Right, If you're developing an autonomous vehicle, user classes should be user has a driver's license, user is um, a valid driver, has zero record, I, whatever it's going to be. So lots of things we have to talk about in terms of what the system will be doing. <clears throat> and then we get into the actual requirements. So what are our functional requirements at a system level? What are our specific requirements? Do we have any external interfaces we have to deal with? Right. So if you're developing a phone application, do you have to reach out to a cloud-based API? Are you talking to Firebase? Are you talking to some external database out there? Are you pulling data off of a website? Right? What are you talking to? Do you have a interface to hardware? Right? If you're developing a phone app for doing payments, are you interacting with that little thing that you plug in so people can swipe their credit cards? You have communications interfaces. How are you talking to things? Are you using Bluetooth? Are you using JSON? Are you using REST calls? Are you doing sockets? How are you talking to stuff? Basically, you very clearly and specifically say exactly how you're formatting things. OK? Functionals, interfaces, we have non-functionals. So again, here you see performance, you see quality. Uh, once the fading happens, safety and security. So your system has to provide for user safety. This could mean, like in an autonomous vehicle, you don't crash into a pedestrian, don't crash into a wall. Um, your system doesn't discharge electricity and shock somebody. It depends on what you're doing, right? But Safety can be a non-functional as well. This is, again, dependent on who is providing the structure for your document. We're not going to do this much detail for ours. We'll do a limited snapshot of this type of thing, but the general concept is pretty, pretty common. Um, so we'll get into that. But here we have some specific 
safety constraints. So these would be requirements um, that we have for a particular system. And again, I came out of automotive, so you get some automotive requirements here. ACC, this is adaptive cruise control. This is a system where you can like set the cruise control on your car. And based on how quickly the car in front of you is going, it will try to match the speed. So that you have a nice, like, if you set the cruise to 70 and the car in front of you goes 65, you would drop to, say, 65 to match so you don't blast into the back of the car there. But what are some constraints here? What are some specific safety requirements? ACC controller should provide the acceleration signal when the target vehicle is no longer in the lane. So if we have a target in front of us, we should still get an acceleration signal from the controller. ACC should not increase the speed when the distance to the target vehicle is too close. So these are shoulds, not shall. So these are, again, safety constraints. They're a little bit broader. But here, let's look at this one. Controller should not increase the speed when the distance is too close. I look at this requirement. You know, it would be a non-functional requirement. Probably be under 5.2 here if these were the same document, I would see some things that I would need more detail on here, okay? Not increase the speed. Okay, so the speed cannot increase if we are too close. Makes sense, don't increase your vehicle's speed. But what does too close mean? Okay, target vehicle is too close. Too close to what? Is it, is three meters too close? Is one meter too close? Is collided too close? Right, what does too close actually mean with respect to this? One millimeter. There you go. Uh, when we talked about the brake delays in the Toyota. <laughs> yeah, perfect. But you see what I mean, though? If you start, like, parsing through these things and you start actually thinking through them, you can see where, okay, if you are a fresh developer hired at a company, and I give you this set of four non-functional requirements, and I say, go implement them you would probably come back to me with a long list of questions. Okay, what does too close mean? What is the acceleration signal? How do I access that signal? So on and so on and so on. Basically, non-functional kind of user or uh, system dependent. Too close might be a configurable value. Okay, because in some of these systems, the user can set what that means. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, too close might be a value that you pull out of a stored variable. User can set their comfortable following distance. But that's not specified in this requirement here. But a future of what you will be doing, and the spoiler warning is that you will be doing this in Markdown. So this is basically going to be a document in your GitHub repositories. So get familiar with how Markdown works. Uh, understand how section headings work because that's um, how you're going to be handling this. And I will give you a template, so it's not like everybody's will look different. Um, I will give you an SRS template. Any of you ever see this picture before? Because it is absolutely delightful. Uh, a little bit blurry, so I apologize for that. But when I was working, I, I want to say this picture had just recently come out. This would have been... 15 years ago now. Um, everybody had this on their cubicles. So this is basically software engineering at its finest. So this is the swing the customer wants. This is what your business consultant described. This is what the project leader understood. Here's your documentation. Here's what we made the customer pay for. And that's all they needed. So if you kind of look at this, you know, other than the uh, slightly cheeky puns here, this is actually a very good metaphor for what really happens for project engineering. But I, I quite enjoy this picture. And it has roots in reality, too. Alrighty, so let's, let's see. Let's talk about NFRs for a moment, and then we will stop probably partway through. And we'll pick back up on Monday with that. So hopefully at this point, functional requirements make sense. Right, we kind of understand what they're doing. 
Non-functionals, I mentioned before, they're kind of global in nature. And again, global, I'm thinking of in terms of the product itself or the project itself. A global aspect of a project would have impacts on everything, right? It's going to have an impact on the customer. It's going to have an impact on development. It will have an impact on the hardware and software. Basically, everything related to this project would be impacted. So with that, uh, with not functionals, we can talk about the product itself, right, what we're building. We might also have organizational requirements. We might have external requirements. Organizational, what does that mean? Well, these might be things specific to your company or your project team or something internal that every single one of your projects will have. Right, maybe you're, by default, going to provide support for as many languages as possible. And if you've ever done web development or yeah, mobile development, realizing that you have to handle different character sets other than your standard um, you know, English-based characters can be tricky. You know, what happens if your text is read right to left instead of left to right? Or you're using Cyrillic or Mandarin or any of the other character sets. That can pose a problem for your systems. Uh, one of uh, my students last semester is really interested in emoji code. How do you support that? You know, um, emoji code, there we go. So here you have a uh, programming language using strictly emojis. How fun is that? Uh, moreover, how much fun would this be to support as parsed text? <laughs> so maybe your organizational requirements have usability requirements or something like that. External requirements, all I see is pain. Me too. I did install it and then I quickly uninstalled it. Just, uh, it was too painful. <laughs> external requirements. These could be multiple things. Could be coming from your customers. Could be covering coming from government organizations. Maybe you have export control requirements where your software cannot be used by X, Y, and Z countries because we are currently mad at them. You know, st stuff like that. So there is lots and lots of concerns here. So you know what what we'll do is we'll end on this slide. So their product requirements. Actually, no, let's end here because we're going to go into a deep, dark well of the different types of non-functionals. But basically, the takeaway here is that be good with technical writing. Okay, Be very, very precise with your functional requirements. And be prepared for your non-functionals to touch every single aspect of your systems. Uh, does anybody have any questions from the content today? Or does everything... More or less makes sense. Again, you'll be getting some practice writing these, and we'll be looking at some next time as well. All right, other than that, if um, there are no questions, so get your homeworks in tonight. Make sure that's all taken care of. Got office hours in a few if there are any lingering questions. And I'll probably, let's see, so I'll put up the study guide fairly shortly and probably a, a small homework assignment. Does everyone have to turn in the group? So the group assignment should be one person per team, the way it's set up. Let me just double check that. Assignments. All right, so it is, got to edit. Group submission, okay. Yep, one person per group. Alrighty, with that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I will see you all Monday, and bye for now. Anytime. Bye-bye.